Thank you, Tom. And thank all of you for being here. Let me just do a quick check here. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to say a bit about social sustainability in the remarks I make today, and I feel it's appropriate and maybe needed, at least for me, to acknowledge and express sorrow over the loss of life and the horrific number of injuries that occurred in, in uh, Boston yesterday before going on. And just to say or express the hope, probably, maybe at least naive, that I think that if we did a better job of understanding and addressing the violence that we inflict on the earth, maybe, just maybe, we would do a better job of understanding and addressing the violence that we inflict on each other. Once um, in the months just after the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, there was a lively debate about the words uh, sustainable, sustainable development, and sustainability. Could these long words, descended from Latin, not so easy to pronounce, harder still to define, ever gain traction in educating the public about the global environmental crisis? Now, a lot of people were dubious. I remember these days. I was in Rio in 92, and some predicted that sustainability was a hopeless term, hopeless concept, and will quickly end up in the dustbin of uh, semantic history. They were wrong. Um, in the video that we just watched, uh, you got a glimpse of where we are today with this concept and where it's, where it's uh, leading us. Um, today, we're probably further from sustainability than we were 21 years ago, and yet we're way deeper into an era of what we here at World Watch have been calling sustainable, um, an explosion of jargon of sustainable sports cars, uh, sustainable clothing, um, sustainable Olympics, sustainable cities, sustainable design, a sustainable everything and the horse or maybe the Ferrari that it drove you here in on. Um, it's not just companies, it's actually the media, it's authors, um, it's environmentalists, it's we ourselves who seem to be using the word with a fervor and a frequency uh, that are inversely proportional to the likelihood that real sustainability is anywhere to be found. And there was um, an interesting linguistic study based on the exponential growth in the use of sustainable that projects actually that in less than a century, this once reviled term will be the only word used in the American English language. <laughs> the study was not, unfortunately, peer reviewed, um, but in a rare lapse of uh, standards for state of the world, we published an illustration from it anyway. Now, more seriously, um, at World Watch, we felt that it was time to ask, is sustainability still possible? And if it is, how do we name the real deal? How do we identify it, define it, measure it, move toward it, and someday maybe actually achieve it, someday soon, hopefully? It's not enough to simply claim that things are sustainable. What city, what design, what product can really be sustainable in a civilization that in its entirety is anything but? Sustainable is more than a frivolous distraction. It's a dangerous phenomenon. It saps this sense of urgency we need to deal with what amounts to an existential crisis civilization. The dilemma we face here is especially meaningful to the World Watch Institute because for nearly 40 years now, uh, we've had a mission of using research, stories, analysis, and outreach to try to speed the, the shift to a, sustainable, a truly sustainable society that meets human needs. So for us, we have to ask, what does this mean? What is true sustainability? And that's what we're asking with this book in three parts, as uh, Tom mentioned. Part one, um, how do we define and importantly, how do we measure sustainability? How do we know when we're going beyond it and by how much? Part two, once we know how far we are from the real thing, what kinds of policies and behavior changes do we need to actually have a prayer of, of achieving this? And finally, part three, because the question really does need to be asked, if we're not going to achieve an equitable 
and environmental and prosperous sustainability anytime soon, how do we prepare for the real possibility that nature and civilization are going to start unraveling around us? Because realistically, they are already in the early stages of unraveling. I'm old enough, and I suspect there are a few others like me here who remember when this particular photograph was brand new, when it was on the front pages of newspapers and on the covers of magazines. Uh, chapter author Dwight Collins and his colleague remind us that this, this photo was actually named. It had the name Earthrise. Um, it was the classic shot of space shot, spaceship Earth, um, sort of a little small blue marble wandering its way through the dark cosmos. One of the first Apollo astronauts ever to circle uh, the moon snapped this photo on Christmas Eve 1968. I'm going to take a closer look. This is a planet with 3.6 billion people, about half, half of today's population. Its atmosphere contains 324 parts per million heat trapping carbon dioxide. If you lived here, Bill McKibben could retire. Instead, he and his organization, indefatigably, 350.org, are working to deal with the fact that we have 397, almost 400 parts uh, per million CO2 surrounding us today. But on this planet, thousands of species of plants and animals are growing and creeping and swimming and flying that have since vanished. This is a photograph of a world that was closer to true sustainability than our world is today. Now, even in 1968, of course, we were moving pretty rapidly away from true uh, sustainability. And let's define that right now simply as living decently in the present without undermining the capacity of future generations to live just as decently as we are doing. An activity is sustainable if it can, can continue indefinitely on its current scale, at its current pace, without in any way undermining the conditions that allow it to operate. And we've been on a dangerous trajectory for, away from true sustainability for a long time, accelerating along it, in fact. And acute observers actually have been observing and commenting on this for, for, on our predicament, really, for a number of decades. Note the, uh, the calendar year in this cartoon, 1.999 billion, million, sorry, BC. Actually, nature stored up reserves of carbon over a period of several hundred million years, which we're managing to vaporize in a couple of centuries. But this particular cartoonist, J. Dane Darling, um, he was actually in the Roosevelt administration for a while during the New Deal, but he mostly was a cartoonist for the Des Moines Register was right on the number in identifying politics and civilization as the main gluttons at the pantry table. He might have caricatured economic power and population as well, though when this cartoon appeared in 1936, there were just 2.2 billion people on the planet. Still, each of them, rich, more than poor, but each of them nonetheless, making demands on the world's sustaining resources, and often over the next 75 years, even then, fighting over land, oil, and other scarce resources. Now, it's likely that awareness of the way this dynamic works and how it affects all of us on the planet has had at least some impact on tapping the brakes uh, in some areas in the, in the trajectory that we're on. Um, in the good news department, uh, the pace of population growth has been slowing significantly over the last few decades. Uh, family size is half of what it was in 1960. That's a tremendously helpful development. Um, the ozone hole is actually healing. That's a real success story. Um, air pollution and water pollution are down, at least in developed countries, significantly, and in some cases um, in, in developing ones as well. Um, some forests are expanding. Some fisheries are bouncing back. Investments in renewable energy are taking off, not just in industrialized countries, but in particularly in the rapidly emerging industrializing countries of China and India as well, um, but also elsewhere around the world. And from a social perspective, amazingly, uh, as we just learned from a human development report that came out a couple weeks ago, 
the middle class is expanding rapidly, not just in China and India, where we're beginning to get used to this, but actually in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and pretty much everywhere in the developing world. Although it's worth noting that there are still 1.2 1 billion people around the world who live on less than a dollar a quarter a day, so we're not all middle class yet. Now, we can hardly begrudge the expansion of the middle class to other people. Far be it from us to say that they shouldn't be joining the middle class. And some commentators use this rapid expansion of the middle, middle class and the fact that we are successfully, in many ways, achieving millennium development goals related to the, the um, alleviation of poverty to say, planetary boundaries, what planetary boundaries? They either don't exist or if they do, pretty obviously, they don't ma matter very much. Um, but it's just this capacity to conduct a fire sale on natural resources. This is in particular is a, a chart from the book on what we're doing with non-renewable resources. Um, that, so that billions of us can consume more today that threatens to bring on a future in which real prosperity is possible only for a few and possibly for no one. Now, rapidly increasing greenhouse gas emissions are a special case. Human-caused global warming is the most obvious and certainly the most dangerous, or arguably the most dangerous anyway, expression of our unsustainability. We can hope that eventually we will figure out ways to simply keep fossil fuels in the ground for as long as possible. That's the topic of one of our chapters in State of the World 2013. As uh, author Thomas Prinson and his co-authors note, there will be a time when fossil fuels are reserved for tasks in which they alone uh, are best suited. We'll also need to stabilize atmospheric concentrations of dozens of other greenhouse gases. But as you can see, we're not doing this yet. We had a discussion about this at the morning with some reporters. Um, James Hansen, former now uh, NASA climatologist James Hansen, projects that with business as usual, and I should say that some climatologists do disagree with them on this point, probably a lot of other people, that if we continue business as usual, there really is a danger of a, run a runaway greenhouse effect, and that we could end up with the conditions that are sustainable and stable on the planet of Venus, um, which is a very hot and very dead planet. And this book is beginning to sound like heavy going, but it's actually not. Uh, it has humor. It's got a dash of clear-eyed Buddhist advice on being fully present in times of change. Um, it's got some practical ideas for how we can address our problems. It's got one or two that probably aren't so practical, but worth considering anyway, uh, for surviving any uh, catastrophes that, that happen along the way. Among the book's more practical ideas, um, is a call for a rigorous definition of sustainability to ward off sustainable and to get serious about addressing the future. Once we define sustainability as that which can endure and takes the future into account, we can begin to measure the impacts of our activities and see which are sustainable and how far others are from true sustainability. Planting and caring for trees, for example, under the right conditions is very much truly sustainable withdrawing water from rivers and aquifers faster than they can be recharged by current precipitation is measurably unsustainable. And Sandra Pastel, a longtime World Watch alum, is with us today and will be talking about that uh, later today. Author Carl Folke, who wasn't able to be with us today from the Stockholm Resilience Center, argues that in at least three areas, species loss, nitrogen pollution, and human-caused climate change, We've clearly already broken through the boundaries of planetary um, sustainability. And that we're approaching the bounds, at least in ocean acidification, again in water withdrawals and a number of other areas. Now the planetary boundary measurement, which has gotten some attention, good and bad, in the last few years, is definitely a work in progress. It's, um, there's a lot more data we're going to need to really understand these boundaries well and to what extent they're, we're, we're moving into unsustainability. But this kind of inventory and measurement is exactly what we will need if we intend to use the concepts and the words around sustainability with any real seriousness. Author Kay Walworth, who's represented in this piece overall, uses a similar methodology in designing metrics for the social aspects of sustainability. Now notice that she places the safe sphere for humanity, the metrics of, of social sustainability within 
the circle of biophysical sustainability. This is a very important point, and it raises the question, the United Nations, the World Bank, and others express the hope, it's widespread, that environmental sustainability can be united uh, with inclusive economic growth. Um, but there's no guarantee that these objectives can be achieved together and harmoniously. We're best off looking at each of them separately and then combining them to see what's possible within the limits of the planet to assure an equitable, low consumption prosperity that can endure. The sustainability metric of equity and fairness may be among the hardest of all to calculate, but when we do, the true implications of inclusive economic growth are likely to force us to acknowledge that for most of the wealthier among us, this is probably going to involve some inclusive economic shrinkage. We should be thinking now about how to turn that into as positive a process as possible. It's not clear that every idea out there is a good one. Geoengineering is getting more attention as climate change gets more dire. We aren't going to sit around and on our hands while the world falls apart, after all. There are iron filings to dump in the oceans. There are sulfur droplets to squirt into the stratosphere. Um, there are giant sunshades to launch into orbit. There are electrodes to plant in our brains to make us feel as though it's 70 degrees all the time. I did make up that last idea, but I'm expecting it every day, any day now. Um, author Simon Nicholson, who's with us here in the audience, suggests that geoengineering may, rather than save us, spur social and political disruption as rogue actors um, try out their, their own crazy ideas, essentially experimenting with the planet and with all of us in the process as test subjects. On the plus side, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere with tree planting and improving, improving soils is probably a good idea. It's safe and it's non-intrusive, but research on the riskier last-ditch options is not going to fade away. So Nicholson described a set of guidelines known as the Oxford Principles, which I found very interesting for this research. And the Oxford Principles, not surprisingly agreed to at Oxford University, propose one, full disclosure, two, public participation and decision making, three, regulation as a public good, four, independent pre-assessment of likely impacts, and five, demonstrated good international governance before any geoengineering deployment. And I'd mention that these principles could serve us well in other high-risk areas of innovation, such as nuclear energy, nanotechnology, and genetic manipulation. My own favorite constructive ideas, and this too came up this morning with the press, include carbon taxes, using most of the revenue to alleviate poverty and provide meaningful jobs to everyone who, who wants one, and preventing unintended pregnancies. Research we're conducting at the World Watch Institute suggests, it's in its early phases, that a, a world population in which every pregnancy that occurs is actually intended could actually reverse population growth before the middle of the century and before the much anticipated nine billion population. Now, the overconsumption of the rich always complicates the discussions of to what extent population matters in these issues. But I suspect that when we finally get down to acknowledging the equal right of every human being to the Earth's resources, it's going to be a wonderful thing if there are not so many of us on so degraded a planet that equality simply means permanent poverty for everybody. At the moment, we're at best stumbling along a path toward economic growth that is neither inclusive nor environmentally sustainable nor just. And that brings us to the question of how we are going to manage to run our very much crowded world. That's a topic so big that we devoted not one but two chapters to it in this State of the World. And we're going to be making it the theme for our next edition of State of the World, on State of the World 2014. In a moment, I'm going to ask David Orr, who wrote one of our two chapters, to, to say a few words of it at the end of my talk. Um, but for right now, I'm going to steal just a little bit of his thunder uh, and just remark that one of the biggest problems we have with government and sustainability is this tendency, this temptation governments have to um, subordinate public well-being to private interests, one that we're very familiar with here in Washington, D.C. Given that intransigence, what's the role of resistance. It's something we felt we really did need to take on. Chapter author Bron Taylor acknowledges the ethical complexities of this topic, but he urges us to break the taboo against talking about it. 
He argues that the moral wrong that contemporary humanity is inflicting on other species and on the future justifies consideration of civil disobedience and direct action resistance. Now, there's no easy uh, guidelines or answers to how we handle this particular issue. But I think it's safe to say that the history lessons of great leaders like Mohandas Gandhi, uh, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, suggest that the path of resistance has often been essential to needed social change. I suspect that before resistance will be truly effective, we need to grow a social and political movement for true sustainability. And unlike some forces in today's world, this is a movement that needs to grow fast. Um, and the challenge here is how to get people, as well as politicians, to care about future generations, non-human life and the poor in faraway places. That won't be easy, but that may be the most important task ahead of us. Is sustainability still possible? Now, Tom Crew opened by saying that some of us have our doubts. Spoiler alert, this book doesn't fully answer the question. But science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson, who has the last word in the book and will be speaking uh, with us later today, applies common sense to the question. And he concludes that, of course, it's still possible. But we need to build this movement, and we need to act now. And we need to think about how much realistically we can save, given the trajectory we're now on. My own hunch is that we don't need to answer the question. The answer isn't as important as simply getting down to work and doing what needs to be done. Most of the sustainability work that lies ahead of us isn't going to occur in the stratosphere or even in the biosphere, but in the social sphere, where change can occur with surprising speed. The abolition of slavery was the work of a number of generations, but we don't have that kind of time. But if we look at civil rights, if we look at women's rights, if we look at the demise of social smoking, we see changes in the social sphere that happen with surprising rapidity. And if we need a more contemporary example, just look at how fast opinion has changed in this country and elsewhere around the world on same-sex marriage. More than anything, we need to learn and to engage others on the point that the world is indeed finite and that it is in fact pretty full and that we are many. And that none of us has the right to claim more of the planet's ecological space than any other. In order to survive what's heading our way, we're going to need to learn to make do and make the most of natural resources that just simply are not as abundant as they once were. We're going to need to learn how to share the resources that are least governed by the harsh laws of physics and biology in this finite world are the human ones, our capacity for innovation, and just as much our capacity for compassion, for working in partnership, for love of the earth, and for each other and ourselves, our neighbors of all nations. No matter how close we get to true sustainability or by how much we fall short of it, it's these human resources that we're going to need most of all. So thank you very much. Thanks, and I'm, I'm hoping we still have a few moments in this, session, this section before we move on to the panels, um, before we, uh, we break for, to get the panels up here. And as I mentioned, I did think I would just ask David Orr uh, who's a fairly new member um, to the, the World Watch Institute, but an old friend of many of ours who's been, been fans of his writing and his work for many years. Um, Tom was nice enough to call my chapter magisterial. I would reserve that right for David's. I, I hope you read it. Um, he's going to be guiding us in our theme and uh, our coming theme on governance. But I thought I'd kick it off to David and say, if you want to say a few words about your thoughts on, uh, and I hope somebody can pass a microphone to David, on governance for sustainability, and then maybe either ask a question or we'll just open it up uh, while all of you think about whether you've got a few. Uh, first of all, Bob, that was a great overview. Thanks for that, and thanks for your leadership with uh, World Watch. Uh, I'm going to say three things very quickly and then sit down. Uh, there are a couple of debts I'd like to acknowledge. One to Herman Daly. Herman, where are you sitting? Herman, back back here. Herman, uh, 
I met Herman in 1973 when we did an event in Atlanta with uh, Governor Carter. And Herman came down to instruct Atlanta, including the Federal Reserve governors, on uh, sustainable economics and steady state economy. It didn't take. Uh, but they're, they're still working on it. They're still playing. Sandra Postel is sitting here. Sandra is a long-term mentor uh, to me about issues of water. So Sandra, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, my colleague, Michael Maniates. Mike, where are you sitting? Mike is back here in the back. Mike, uh, we've had the honor and good fortune to have Mike on our staff at Oberlin for the past two years. And he's not just a scholar, but he's a great colleague and a great sense of humor. And he's added a lot to our program, and we're going to miss him. Uh, let me just say very quickly, my chapter was on uh, governance in the long emergency. Uh, and relative to that, uh, there are a lot of ways to define the source of the problems that Bob described. One is to see it as an issue of technology. And that is kind of an American trait to see, you look for the next gadget that solves everything. Uh, and I think it is a technological issue. There are technological aspects to it. The second is to see it as an economic issue. And I think uh, Lord Stern described it, uh, climate change as the largest market failure in history. I took a third approach. It was a political failure long before it was a market failure. The first warning to a US president about the seriousness of climate change was in 1965. Uh, in 1976, Herman and Dennis Hayes uh, and I were part of a group that uh, put the issue before Governor Carter or President-elect Carter uh, in 1976. We still have no de jure policy on climate change. So it's an issue of foresight. It's an issue of also the way we govern. The National Environmental Policy Act in 1969 called for systems governance. In other words, looking at a whole uh, range of variables together. We haven't learned how to do that. It's an issue of foresight, uh, of systems governance. It's also an issue of morality. And I think it makes it very difficult when 400 people in this country have more net worth than the bottom 150 million people. It corrupts the politics in all kinds of ways. It's an issue of um, longevity. Carbon, as Jim Hansen and others have said to us for a long time, stays in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So this is an issue that we've now got to think of governance over uh, this period called the long emergency. Uh, and that's, uh, that's not my phrase, that was a borrowed phrase. But we have to now think of governance and structures of governance at all levels. It goes for a long time. And the last thing I would say is this. Uh, this is a room full of heroes and heroines. And this issue, if we are to survive through the rapids of human history, will require a lot of leadership. The root of the word governance means steersman. And we need governance. We need people who are at all levels, who think of uh, the long term, think of systems, have compassion, and can reach out. And so we've got to rebuild structures of governments that we have been dismantling uh, for the past uh, three or four decades. Uh, so that's my story. Uh, I'm sticking to it. It's an honor to be here. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, David. And I, I apologize. I probably went longer than I was supposed to. Um, so time is running on. I think what I'll do is suggest is there one burning question that could be quickly asked and the toughest part quickly answered by me. Uh, and if not, if there isn't, great. If there is, I'll take at least one. And then if there are more uh, questions people would like to address to me, I'll be here the rest of the uh, afternoon and as well be hanging around at the reception. Please do ask. But I'll just see if there's a burning, someone is, is uh, willing to make a burning question. Otherwise, we'll move on and perhaps get on time. Not to discourage you. Aha, we have a burning question. A uh, lady uh, in the black, black back there. Whereabouts? Thank you, uh, Helen Santiago Fink, USAID. Um, as an urban climate change advisor for the agency, I remain an optimist that uh, sustainability is still possible. But to the point that the gentleman made, how do we initiate, how do we instigate the system's governance and the political leadership that is necessary to bring us to a world of sustainability? <laughs> Come back next year, we'll have all the answers. Um, <laughs> I, well, I would suggest that you read the chapters. I think, I, as I alluded in my um, in my talk, I think really the responsibility rests in many ways, or the, the, the responsibility for acting now as, as energetically as we can rests with people like the folks of us here at the World Watch Institute, our many friends and supporters, uh, yourselves, people like David, writers, speakers. We re I, I feel we really need to build a social movement. I don't think we have the social movement, political movement that is there yet. 
uh, to, to really take on this issue the way it needs to be taken on. I think Bill McKibben is doing a great job with 350.org. He's one of my heroes. I really admire him. Um, I think people who are willing to basically just, you know, Bill just said, I'm not going to do a lot more writing. I just, we, we got to organize. Um, some, I think there's a new article in the New Yorker, Tom Prue brought this to my attention, uh, by Nicholas Lehman, uh, the former dean of the uh, Graduate School of Journalism at uh, Columbia University, which was my own graduate school, um, in which he talks about the kind of movement that uh, Civil War uh, veterans uh, made after the Civil War to essentially demand their pensions. Now they had a very <coughs> naked self-interest in getting their pensions and you can go down to the pension building down by the Judiciary Square Metro stop right now and see the edifice that was created of the effort that these guys made who fought for us and, and um, brought the Union back together after the Civil War. We've got a much tougher challenge. We've got to get people to care enough about the future, to care enough about their children and their grandchildren um, and people who live in other countries who are being affected uh, by what we do in this country to demand change with the same fervor that someone who believes they're owed a pension by the federal government um, uh, needs change. So that's a tough thing to do. So I don't have a great answer that we're going to get great governance immediately. But I am optimistic about the speed of change. I mentioned the, the acceptance of same-sex marriage. Um, there are a lot of surprising and, and um, I think, positive results in the last election we had in this country on recognition of the diversity and the youth of our electorate. I think opinions are changing fast, and I actually am fairly optimistic that from the social perspective and the political perspective, uh, we might get there faster than we, uh, than we are thinking now we will. But we need to move really fast. Thank you very much, and um, I look forward to the rest of the panels. I hope you all can hang around for the rest of the afternoon because it's going to be great. Thanks.